Wyoming's best adventure starts in Wind River Country, located in western Wyoming, just beyond Yellowstone National Park and the Grand Teton Mountains. Wind River Country is the place to go to get away from the crowds, unplug, unwind, and find room to roam. Wyoming's Wind River Country, Yellowstone's unique neighbor. Hey, we are back with another episode for Wyoming's Wind River Country, Yellowstone's unique neighbor, and I'm with one of the crew with Sinks Canyon State Parks. I have Skylar Sargent with me. Skylar, how are you? I'm doing great. Skylar was a part of the Constellation party that we had, too. We have an episode out for that where we get to talk about the designation for Sinks Canyon State Park in the dark sky. So please go back and check out that episode. I'm pretty excited. Helen is with me. Michael as well, Wind River Visitors Council. Guys, we're going cave trekking. We yes. are. And Ooh. we're dressed. We're ready. We've got helmets. We've got gloves. It's a beautiful day. And we are excited. I feel so cool. And like I'm an official cave trekker. But <laughs> Skylar, your title, job title today is Cave Tour Guide. How cool is that? Definitely one of the more exciting parts of my job. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going to happen today. Yeah, so we're going to go into Boulder Choke Cave, and it's called Boulder Choke for a reason. The, the tightest squeeze of this cave is the entrance where you squeeze through some granite boulders in the overflow channel. We're going to do a little bit of crawling beforehand, but then at some point we'll be able to stand up walk around, check out the rest of the cave. We're going to be following one main channel the majority of the way, and it's pretty hard to get lost down there, but Pretty easy to get turned around, so we're gonna wanna stick that's, together. As that's where you come in. That's play. where I come in, yeah. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Was I the only one that couldn't sleep last night? I was so excited. Well, Helen, you've done this before, and you're an adrenaline junk anyways, so. <laughs> I haven't done it in a while, and it, it's definitely different every single time, and I'm excited to see what it looks like down there. Michael, the waiver we signed, which everybody, if you're involved with this, you sign a waiver, which, by the way, you can be involved in these treks as well. We're taking a private tour with Skylar, so thank you so much. But Absolutely. Michael, when I got to the rappelling part and it said, can you rappel eight feet? I said, no, but I marked yes anyways. <laughs> I'm hoping it's just going to be a mellow, slanted rope climb down a pretty down easy something pretty straight we won't have any issues <laughs> not too technical helen you've done it before pretty easy yes nothing to worry about oh nothing to worry about that makes me excited but i was a little i was like i'm a little afraid of heights how what it, i didn't know what to expect skylar so anything else along the route to, to be mindful of other than the advertised eight foot drop which is more of a little slide there is a Hole that we call the toilet bowl. It's in the lunchroom. I'll be in front of the group and so I'll be pointing it out. But what we really want to do is just stick to the left hand side of the trail and we should be fine. It's a pretty easy slope down into the room and we shouldn't have any issues. Does this toilet bowl suck you in? Will it suck you in? It does Can not it suck you in. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. If there's any kind of suction, something is terribly wrong. It's a small hole. It's just a five foot drop, but it's something that comes out of nowhere. And so we just want to make sure everyone's mindful of its location. I'm looking forward to a little lesson in not only cave trekking, but this great piece of Fremont County. Helen, it's so great that the Wind River Visitors Council does things like this. Of course, this podcast is aimed as an immersive experience. So we're taking our recording equipment into the cave with us. Looking forward to our next portion. We're here. I cannot see or seem to find the entrance. It's that well hidden. Is that on purpose, Skylar? Yeah. So we don't really like to advertise the entrance of the cave. We just don't want anyone being able to stumble their way upon it. Now the entrance is gated off and you do need a key to be able to get in there. And that helps prevent people from sneaking their way in. It's the tightest squeeze at the entrance, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you don't want to be claustrophobic necessarily. To... Right. And it's usually at this point when people are looking into the entrances, whether or not they finally decide whether they're going in. <laughs> <laughs> Great, I'm one of those people. <laughs> so we've reserved three hours usually for a tour. Rarely do we actually meet that time frame. So usually it's around an hour, 45 minutes to an hour actually in the cave. That three hours also includes gearing up and then the debrief and decontamination afterwards. And so our main concern is white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease that affects bat populations. It's moving west across the United States and is hammering their population. And so we'd like to try and do our best to make sure we're stopping the spread. We have Skylar with us, Helen with the Wind River Visitors Council. Michael has joined us as well. We do have Ella too, who has joined us. She's gonna be bringing up the caboose. You mentioned that it's important to have two people on the trek to make sure that none of us get lost, I assume. <laughs> Yeah, it helps to have two sets of eyes uh, looking over the group. Also in the very unlikely situation that something were to happen to the main guide, we wanna make sure that there is also someone who is able to lead everybody out. All right, we'll be back as we get through this entrance and <laughs> see how awesome it is. You guys ready? Yes. Absolutely. All right, stand right there. 
That was crazy. But <laughs> 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 woohoo! That seemed like an easier entrance than the other one we were trying to. I actually prefer the other entrance. Okay. It's a little bit wider. There's a little room right where I'm standing that we'll all stay crouched in, but at least we can gather up. <sighs> all right, we are army crawling right now through this. All right, and where I am right area. here. Where I am right here, you can stand back up. Skylar, that was cool. That's crazy. <laughs> so that's like a 20 foot army crawl. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we dropped down around, let's see, from the boulder pile. We dropped 10 feet actually into the limestone layer, and then we crawled about 20 feet. And now we're standing in the main channel of Boulder Choke Cave. We're in the layer. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and we're going to be pretty much following this the rest of the way. Yeah, welcome to Boulder Choke Cave, everyone. Usually one of the first questions I get is they see the walls here, this texture, and say, Skylar, what's with this weird golf ball texture? And, I, and it's uh, actually pretty unique to a cave that's formed by flowing water. And so what you're looking at is called scalloping. Yeah, it looks like the surface of a golf ball, but if you look closely, it looks like someone took a spoon and chipped away at the rock in one, one particular direction, pretty much all the way down. It took me forever to dig this out. Now, uh, what this actually tells us is the one, that this cave was um, absolutely formed by flowing water, two, that it floods, and three, what direction the water actually flows. Now, as we're standing here, we can get a sense for the general slope of the cave. Obviously, the water's gonna be moving down that way, but if that weren't so obvious, what you can do is take your finger, find a ridge line, and then on one side is going to be a deeper gouge into the rock than the other. So usually on this wall, you're gonna see that on the left-hand side. It's a deep gouge next to the ridge that comes up a gentle slope to the next ridge, continuing left. Another deep gouge, gentle slope, up to the next ridge. So what that's telling us is that the water on this wall is moving from right to left. And so what's going on is as it's moving across the surface here, there's little imperfections on the surface of the limestone that causes water to do a tiny little backflow, a little swirl, digs into the limestone. And so we also get a comparison of speed that the water is flowing in between scallops. So if you look at the top here, there's some areas that have really large, deeper scallops and compared to these smaller areas, which look more like scales. And so those are different flow rates. So when the water gets really going and fills up completely, it actually slows down along the surface, making larger scalloping. And then when it starts to recede and starts to splash along this area that protrudes down, you get a lot more, lot more smaller scalloping because the water is actually technically moving faster along that surface than if it were completely full. The Madison limestone layer started to form around 350 million years ago, 350 to 375 million years ago, and it started to form on an ocean floor. Just oceans that we get today, there was sea life on that ocean floor as well. And when things like shells get buried in the silt that was gathering up on the floor, we get we start to get fossils. And so we have a little brachiopod sticking through the wall here. See the ridge line like a little clamshell. And that's most of what we're going to get in this cave. We'll see these, but this is a pretty unique specimen actually, because what we usually get are little kind of half moon shapes, like this little guy here, just a little semicircle, little bits, little crystalline structures that are pretty unique compared to the quartz veins that we get over here. And so we don't have any dinosaur bones in here, unfortunately, but we do have, yeah, 350 million year old life that is permanently preserved. And so we'll just keep moving on. When did they start giving cave tours here? Let's see, the actual year that we started giving these tours, I'm not entirely sure. It was back in the 90s, but it was always word of mouth. Like it wasn't, mm -hmm. the, we didn't really have a set schedule of tours. Basically, if you were someone who knew someone who worked in the canyon, you could call up and ask for a private tour. And then it depended on staff availability. We, within, yeah, about two years ago, decided that, that was something that we could actually expand on and invite more people in because we realized that no one in the area even knew that this cave existed, despite <laughs> living in Lander only, what, right? 15 minutes away? Yeah. It's <laughs> um, funny how that happens in your own backyard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To this day, I still get people who are like, I've lived in Lander for 20 years. I never knew this existed. I assume by the look of the rope, we're at the repelling. We're, we're at the repelling. Now, not quite an eight foot drop as advertised. And we have a brand new anchor in. And so 
This is a very sturdy rope. There's two ways to do this. You can lean back like you're in a Mission Impossible movie, or you can turn around, plant your seat, and use the rope to just help guide you down. But the bottom is right here. Like I said, not quite as, as dramatic as our waiver rope implies. <laughs> Shireen, I think you should go down backwards. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I, I want to go down. And I'm going to get your picture so okay. everybody listening can see it. <laughs> that I made it. <laughs> All right. I brought snacks enough in case I got lost in here. So. <laughs> Excellent. And I dried up that slide for you, too. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Because you said it's a little slippery. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm really glad this is not eight foot, by the way. Shireen, yeah. smile. Look like you're having fun. Okay, yeah, this is a little different. Woo, okay. All right, and then you can probably step down from there. Okay, whoa, I did it. <laughs> Thanks, Helen, for having me do that. The old anchor, that's what I'm curious about. Oh, nothing <laughs> broke. <laughs> it just been a few yeah. years, and so we, yeah, we had the Climbers Alliance actually come down and help us install a new one. It's a titanium anchor that he told me was going to outlast the limestone that it's in, so I think we're set. <laughs> so besides from bats, are there any other animals that like to come down here? Yeah. At this point, it's mostly insects. Now we have that cage over the entrance, so we're not gonna get any hibernating bears or mountain lions or anything coming down here. But we do get, we do get a lot of crickets. There's worms all throughout the soil here that we're now standing on. And we also get a pretty unique form of bacteria that grows on the surface here. Later on in the cave, we might be able to see some fish as well that have been living in this cave for generation after generation or slowly adapting to cave life. We believe them to be blind and their skin is either white or translucent. And so they're a pretty unique thing to see, but sometimes they're, they're a little skittish, so we'll see if they're there today. You might have noticed that we don't have any stalagmites or stalactites in this cave. And that is because of the annual flooding. And so every June, usually late May, early June, we get what we call overflow season where all the snow melt from the wind rivers comes into the Poposia River and the Poposia goes from around 30 cubic feet per second to 2,400 cubic feet per second. That was the highest that I've seen so far. And this cave can only take so much water, but as it's rushing through here, it washes away any calcite crystals or anything that forms on the ceiling or floor. But what we do get is actually a very a unique type of bacteria that grows on the surface of the limestone here. And you can see all this mud and everything that's washed up on the surface that decomposes. And as that bacteria eats all that nutrients, produces waste like any other organism. And that waste takes the uh, shape of these small little hair-like tendrils. And some of them can actually extend down to the floor. Now these are called snotites. This is their true scientific name. You're welcome to look it up <laughs> as soon as we have service. They're a pretty actually unique formation in caves. You have to have very specific conditions for them to grow, like the amount of water that we have constantly on the ceiling here, as well as a constant food source, which is all this mud that splashes up, and then temperature and everything all have to be pretty specific. But they're unique because they live in a completely dark environment. There's no sunlight, there's no photosynthesis or anything like that. And so despite the fact that we don't have any stalagmites or stalactites, we have our little snotty boys and we're pretty proud of them. They look like tinsel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these little hairs yeah. are coming down. That's what we're looking at. We also have our first little side channel that you guys are welcome to go and explore. It is a little muddy and slippery. A way to a walk up this one and then just to the right, there's this crawl space as well. And two people go to the end of either one. You can see each other underneath. Otherwise, we're actually gonna continue down this way. Up ahead here, we're gonna get back on our hands and knees. And this only lasts a couple minutes and then we'll be able to stand up, walk around again. This is just washed in deposited silt and stuff, right? Yep, yeah. all the silt, yeah, washed in from the probably, surface. Probably changes every year a bit. Exactly, and that's actually what I was about to get into. Huh? And usually I talk about it back there. But uh, yeah, so all the silt that we're on washes around. We have, I believe the sink starts to overflow at around 900 cubic feet per second. And so we have about 900 CFS coming through here, washing all this silt around. And so some side channels will get filled up, some will get dug out. And every year we have to come in and do a quick survey before the caving season starts and make sure, one, that everything is safe. There's nothing new that's collapsed or anything like that. 
how the tour has to change, if it has to change. Back where we were, where I invited you guys to go up that steep, muddy slope, that one year was actually just jam-packed full of silt. We couldn't go in there. Ooh. But there was another one behind us that was a crawl space about 15 feet, which you guys didn't see because it's now currently packed full of silt. Ooh. Yeah, the cave changes. Uh, the silt gets washed around. Things, we have to adjust the tours on occasion. We're not gonna we're not gonna change the cave environment for our own purposes. Yeah. This is still a, a pretty wild place mm -hmm. that we don't really wanna change for our own purposes. We wanna conserve and protect it. Mm -hmm. Hence the gloves and overalls right. and providing all the equipment ourselves. And you can hear the low rumble of the river at this point. Which we will be able to go and sit by the riverbank. Yeah, and some years it's barely different at all. There isn't a ton of change from this mm -hmm. year to last year. Enough to make it interesting. <laughs> And so we are coming up to the lunchroom. I'll let you know when we want to stick to the left-hand side up here. You can see the, the humidity just floating in the air. It's not, a, it's not a huge tumble, but yeah, if everyone just sticks to the left-hand okay. side, I just want to make sure oh, that we're is all a aware. Big hole. And then if you want, you can actually have a seat on the, the limestone outcropping right there. So we call this the lunchroom, mainly because of the stool I am standing mm. on. It's a lunch table, but it's my throne now. <laughs> to our left that we are keeping cautious of, or to my left, to your guys' right, is what we call the toilet bowl. Previous tours, that's where we would have crawled out of. And it's only like a, a five foot drop into a small little room that connects to a lower section of the cave that we, we actually have deemed off limits to tours, or to our more recent tours. What percentage <laughs> of people that come down here need to leave because they're claustrophobic? Probably. I would say maybe 1%. 1%. Um, so most people can do this. This is a, a good tour yeah. for most visitors. This is a very easy entry level tour. Mm -hmm. And honestly, what we've seen is that now people will see the entrance and decide right then and there whether they actually want to do this or not. Yeah, I hope more people find out about this in the area. But we have so many visitors that come to Grand Teton and Yellowstone that drive through the Lander area. I I'm sure you, get, you pick up some of those folks, too, that are looking for cool things to do. Oh, yeah. A large percentage of our traffic are people who are just traveling to Yellowstone. They found a they were looking for a place to camp along the way and our park popped up. Yeah, yeah, that's why this podcast is called Wyoming's Wind River Country, Yellowstone's Unique Neighbor, because oh, yeah, there we, we really are. <laughs> and as far as ages, do you have a minimum age for people yeah. coming in? So we have a minimum age of 10, 10 years old right now. And yeah, and that's honestly to make sure that they can be independent because when you're crawling through or when you're going up and down the rope, you don't want a parent who's also trying to hold their kid in the process. Yes, it's an easy and entry level cave, but there is a level of, of independence that is required to be able to actually maneuver this experience. So yeah, we keep it at 10 years old. Our caving season is usually around September to end of March. But what we're really looking at is, the, is what the water's doing. What the snow melt is doing in the spring and then what the water is doing in the fall. Like we started taking people in this year actually in August and those were again just some special programs not part of our main every other Saturday tour. We felt confident that we could take people in here because the water had receded for long enough and everything was dry in here but we're very closely monitoring the water and we like to give at least a month's window between our last tour and the estimated flood year which again, is based on temperatures when the flood last year was. And yeah, is this we, like a microclimate in the winter when you take yeah. trucks, yeah, like warmer in here? It's significantly warmer in here. Mm. It stays a, a steady 50 to 55 degrees. And so it can be negative 20 degrees out and we'll still do a tour because we're down here, it's warm. Yeah. We'll be taking off our seven layers of winter <laughs> yeah. gear as soon as we crawl in. That is, of course, unless the entrance is buried under snow, and then we're not, of course, not going in the cave that day. Michael, you do a lot of activities, I imagine, outdoors. Yes, I do. I try. If you're friends with Helen, you do. Is this something that was on your bucket list? No, I hadn't even thought about this. I've been in some different kind of caves, lava tube caves up in Northern California. I've never been to any of the big national park caves or anything, and I didn't really realize anything about this actually until Helen told me about this opportunity. This is really something else. Another thing that we're watching throughout the season is just precipitation. There's a general rule in caving of if there's gonna be rain that day or during the time that you're in a cave that we, you do not go in that cave. And so now we don't actually see 
no serious fluctuations in the river that are caused by that day's precipitation, but we just never know. We don't want to we don't want to test that. So we're just sticking to, again, standard caving protocols that people should be following. And we don't make our cave any different. I can imagine the claustrophobia, as long as, as, long as lights are on, you can see, it's yeah. big open space, but boy, if the lights are out, whoo, you just <laughs> Exactly. And that's why I've got a yeah, ton of spare lights, ton backup. of spare batteries. <laughs> there is a general rule in caving that you have three, three spare lights in addition to your main one. And I just carry that for everybody because yeah. can't always rely on everyone to bring their own spare lights. Speaking of which though, does anyone want to experience what it's like to be in a cave with all the lights off? Yes. Sure. <laughs> so I'm actually going to keep mine on for a little bit because there is actually a, an interesting phenomenon that your brain does when all the lights are off. Now something that your brain does in low light situations, let's say you wake up in the middle of the night to go and get a drink of water from the fridge, your brain will actually fill in the blanks of what it expects to be there. And it's just a way to help with your night vision. And like it might fill in the location of your coffee table. You might not actually be able to see your coffee table, but your brain expects it to be there. So it'll project that image in front of you. You might be able to see the, the handle to the fridge and it might try and fill in the blanks here in the cave. Now, for some of you, this is your first time in here and none of this is really familiar territory for you, but having been in here well over a hundred times at this point, the texture of the cave walls actually will start to appear in my vision. After a few seconds, if I wave my hand in front of my face, I'll see the projection of movement. I won't be able to see the details of my hand, but I'll see something moving in front of me. Hmm. Again, it's not something I can actually see, but it's something that your brain projects in front of you because it expects it. And so you might experience that. You might not see anything at all. Uh, everyone has a different experience when they're trying this out. So. I'm going to turn my light off here in a sec. Uh, I'll keep it off for about 30 seconds before I check in with everyone. And we'll, we'll just enjoy the static of the uh, river and the sort of sensory deprivation effect. This can be too much for some people. And so if that's the case, remember you do have a light on your head. You can turn it on at any point. Yeah, if anyone is uncomfortable, I actually encourage you to turn your light back on. You won't be ruining the tour for anybody. I'll turn this off in three, two, one. Oh my gosh, it's so dark. How's everyone doing? All right. Good. It's funny, I swear I see that scallop thing in the background of my eyes, but it may be just oh, yeah. my eyes. Yeah, we've been looking at scalloping all day, mm -hmm. so <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that appears for you. Yeah, and I'm seeing just enough glow to where I can actually see my hand in my face if I wave it. But let's see. There is another phenomenon that I want to show you guys. So this comes with a backstory. Back when I was around 12 years old, my uncle took me to Lewis and Clark Caverns. That was my first caving experience. It's all on an established path. There's railing, there's mounted lights. And so it's not like a spelunking tour, but it is. It's a really fascinating tour for experiencing what a cave can be like. They did a demonstration where they turned off the lights, they put a light on the wall, held it for a few seconds, pulled it away, and there was a little glowing dot Ooh. on the wall for just a couple seconds. And I was 12, I didn't exactly listen to the explanation as to what was going on, but I went back for a candlelit Christmas tour. Now they didn't do the same demonstration then, but I remembered, and so I asked what, what type of rock they were in, and he said it was the Madison limestone layer. And I was thinking, oh, Perfect. That's the same material, same rock that my cave is in. And so came back here and on a tour, I just grabbed a light. When we had, all had our lights off, held it against the wall, pulled it away. And sure enough, there was a, a glowing dot, which I'm like, thank you for working because this would have just been <laughs> awkward. It was during a tour and <laughs> it was like, this is the first time I'm trying this. So let's see if it works. Choose a spot that is good direction towards you. The trick here, is to not stare at this light. I know it's the only thing you can see right now, and so we're all visual <laughs> reliant creatures, and we just want to stare at the only thing we can see, but mainly what I'm doing is just charging the rock. Cool. And there is a imperfection in the limestone, or what we believe to be the cause of this is an imperfection in the calcite of the limestone where manganese has bled through the rock uh, with the water as it's coming through and bonded with that calcite and created phosphorescent uh, properties. 
And to be honest, that whole scientific explanation might be wrong. <laughs> we're, not, we're not entirely sure why that is, but that's the best explanation that I've been able to find. Uh, so far, I've only gotten it to work in this room. Hmm. And so what that tells me is that there's probably a mineral pocket somewhere above us that, has, that is bleeding into the rock in this room. However, I am not a geologist. I'm not entirely sure. What I'm gonna do is pull this away. And when I do, just have everyone look at exactly where my light is. And it's only gonna last a couple seconds. So we can do this as many times as we need as well. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh. Does anyone I saw see just that? a blip. <laughs> so all three of you saw it? Yeah, yeah I saw a blink. So, yeah, and that little blip is all we're looking at. And so we've tried other we've tried other lights, like much brighter lights on there. There seems to be a cap actually, or a maximum amount of charge that the rock can receive. Hmm. So it never actually gets brighter than, than what you just saw. And Skylar, you mentioned other caves in the area. Are there other caves that people can visit or are those more, more serious and not for, for visitors? I'm never going to and people to seek out caves unless they know what, uh, know what they're doing. Um, so being in a limestone shelf or in a limestone layer of rock and the amount of precipitation we have and the active river that goes through the area, there are other caves that are likely even potentially connected to the cave system that we're in now. But the entrances of which we don't actually advertise, there are likely way more caves in the area than we know about. But the few that we do know of, we don't advertise because we don't want people to go and explore them because they're not yep. fully explored and necessarily mapped out. And even just coming in this cave, which um, has one clear tunnel and a whole bunch of little kind of miniature tunnels coming off of it, I can see how it can be really disorienting. Yeah. And, and yeah, I was curious. I know that this is, this feels like a very safe experience. And I know you've got a lot of the safety equipment. I saw some safety equipment when we first came into the cave itself. Oh, yeah. Are there places in the United States where somebody could go and learn about safety of caving if they wanted to pursue that? Yeah, actually. And there's, there are other advertised commercial cave tours. Like I said, the Lewis and Clark Caverns is one as just an, ex it's just a way to experience a cave. See if that's an environment that you're actually willing to be in. But then if you want to learn spelunking and learn the equipment, learn the ethics behind cave exploration, talk to a a grotto, which is another word for a caving group. There is the National Speleological Society, where most caving groups are actually registered under. And there's, I believe, dozens around the United States. The closest one here is the Hole in the Wall Caving Grotto. I believe they're based out of Casper. I might have to double check that. Is there a degree in caving? <laughs> there is not a degree in caving. There are no certifications currently established for caving. Hmm. However, the National Speleological Society is actually working on establishing cave rescue certifications. And so they do put on trainings, which is the cave rescue training that I went to down over in Cody. We went and did a mock rescue in Spirit Mountain Cave. There are further trainings to do as well, but the best resource for the trainings, for, the, for learning the ethics, for and, and general best practices, and for getting in touch with people who know these things and want to take new people out, the National Speleological Society is the best place to start. But yeah, we can continue on whenever you guys are ready. Here we have the Papogian River. <laughs> we are sitting right by the river. That's crazy. And this is also the only section of the Papogian's underground passage that we have been able to explore. It's filtering up through some cracks in the limestone right up above us and then disappearing into a part of the cave that is yet to be explored. Mainly because it's <laughs> has water, rushing water yeah. through it. Yeah, what's going on upstream and then downstream from here is still a uh, mystery to us. Or a couple hypotheses. One is the water just travels through a whole bunch of cracks and fissures, which slow it down and causes it to take between two and six hours to make it from the sink where it goes underground to the rise. The other hypothesis is that there's a uh, massive underground lake. Also slows it down, dilutes it a bit. That's the fun idea probably not the case. Is this I'm, one of the areas you have to be really careful with people so they don't slip? Exactly, yeah. So I'm always, and you'll see this in my behavior while we're in here, but I'm always keeping myself between you guys and the river. There's a, there's a hole just up here that I like to prevent people from falling in. I'll point that out as soon as we start moving again. The water can get low enough to where it doesn't seem like it can wash you away, but what people don't really realize is that the limestone gets incredibly slippery. 
And so you might have good shoes. It might just be at your ankles, but if you slip, it can, there can be enough water to push you down the, the rest of the slide here. So yeah, this is definitely where I like to keep my eyes out. As we head out here, there's a choice to go back the way we came, which was the repelling section or through <laughs> what Skylar has affectionately called the wormhole. <laughs> All right, Skylar, I made it out of the wormhole. Actually, Michael and I went through the wormhole. Michael, we know why it's called the wormhole. Yes, yes, we do. My arms are completely dirty black from crawling through that was intense wasn't it that was pretty tight stuff yeah that was the real deal that was the real deal yeah that was cool to end it that way though i'm glad that i made the choice to go the more difficult route <laughs> do you get anybody stuck in that thing that they're like i gotta turn back around no we've never had anyone stuck in there yeah generally some people will see that tunnel and just say not today yeah and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah for the most part people are really good at just identifying their own limits and so we haven't had yeah we haven't had any issues Helen, what was your most fun part of the trek? I liked looking for the whitefish. That was fun. And it's so pretty down there. I love the textures on the cave. I love the water. Just that calm pool down there is unexpected with the sound of the rushing river in the background. Yeah, definitely. I wish I would have seen the fish. Michael, you and I are fly fishers. I, we, neither one of us I caught them. didn't em. see them. <laughs> didn't get them. What was your favorite part otherwise? I like sitting by that underground river. It's just sitting by the river watching the water go by. Uh, that's amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah, I think for me, seeing some of the different things on the wall as far as some of the skeletons or... The skeleton? But oh. the skeletons of the the stuff that was there before. Oh, yeah. What do you call it? The fossils. The, the, oh, yeah, sorry. Clearly, I've the been lacking oxygen, Skylar. Do you understand? <laughs> I've been in a cave. <laughs> but yeah, seeing the fossils was very cool. What's our last portion of the trek here that everybody runs through? Yes, this is just a quick decontamination. We're going to get most of the, the dirt off of ourselves, and so then it can make distance infecting the overalls and everything easier later. And so what we're gonna do is just brush off most of the dirt from our shoes and these overalls into this tarp. We then dump everything that we've brushed off back into the cave. So we're just keeping everything that came out, we're putting it back in and- And, and you yeah. said this uh, helps with prevention of the white nose? Yeah, this helps with, it helps prevent white nose syndrome, which again is just affecting bat populations. Being a fungus, it reproduces through spores. And so if there are any spores in our cave, which none have been detected so far, that we're just taking that extra precaution, making sure that if someone were to go into a cave later, that they're not going to be unknowingly spreading these spores around. And so we just want to keep that spread to a minimum and, and yeah, keep our bats healthy. Well, before we go through decontamination, want to bid you adieu. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We'll have another great immersive episode coming up next month. That kind of has to do with Halloween. Excited about that. But make sure you subscribe to Wyoming's Wind River Country, Yellowstone's unique neighbor. Find more with windriver.org. And uh, can't wait. And here we go through decontamination. Thanks for tuning in to Wyoming's Wind River Country, Yellowstone's unique neighbor. Visit us at windriver.org and follow Wyoming's Wind River Country on Facebook and Instagram. This podcast has been brought to you by the Wind River Visitors Council.